Good morning. Uh, thanks for waking up. Uh, this is joint work with my students, Yang Kai and Matt Weinberg at MIT. And I'm going to be talking about uh, auctions and many dimensions. I'm going to motivate the problem soon. So the, the problem I'm interested in is this. So I have uh, M bidders, buyers, and N items. And I want to sell these items to the bidders. And for starters, let's assume that uh, each of these guys is unit demand. He, he wants to buy one item and say that his value for the item is VIJ. So I speed their value for the J item is VIJ. So obviously if I have the VIJs, which I don't, but if I had them, then I would compute a matching or whatever and get the optimal surplus, get the best allocation and so on and so forth. And in fact, uh, just a small comment here. Uh, <clears throat> I can even solve the case where people have demands and budgets, so they want to buy more than one item, so they have budgets on the money they want to pay, uh, and I have to resort to randomization to, to, to go around harness results there. So that's all if I know the VIJs. Uh, what if I don't know the VIJs? Uh, well, then all bets are off. Uh, and we are in the realm of online optimization or something. Okay, so and if you wait till 10.30, Jason's going to be talking about that. What are the right benchmarks? It's easy to see I cannot do, uh, I cannot do well against the, you know, the, the, the surplus, but uh, uh, Jason's going to talk about the, the you know, reasonable benchmarks I can shoot for. So in any event, so my talk is about when uh, we have distributional information about the VIJs. Okay, so there is this uh, joint distribution D that basically is going to tell us the values on all of these edges. All right, it could be jo it could be this, this in principle could be correlated and so, <laughs> so forth, but we assume we know that distribution. Okay, so that's that setting optimizing revenue when we have distributional information about the values is called optimal mechanism design. So, as most of you uh, know, and uh, <coughs> and uh, it goes back to Myerson. Uh, who basically proved that uh, if you're setting a single parameter and the bidders are independent, then there is a closed form revenue optimal mechanism. I mean, that's a sort of like a, without this closed form, it's sort of like a statement about the existence of an optimum. So it's not very interesting. So I'm going to talk about what it means to be closed form. It's not well defined, but in any event. So, but let me address first what is single parameter, because I'm going to be talking about multi parameter settings. So single parameter is uh, when a bidder has a fixed value for winning an item no matter what he gets. Okay, or if he has uh, higher demands, no matter what bundle he gets. All right? So, and I have a distribution for that value. For instance, in my setting, it could be a uniform value in 10, 100, no matter what painting it is. So pictorially, the situation is that on every edge outgoing I, the value is the same, and that's drawn from some distribution that I have. So one parameter determines his payoff. And, uh, well, let me address what closed form is, which is sort of like in the eye of the beholder. So, uh, but in this case, it means that uh, revenue optimization reduces to running VCG in some related setting. Uh, obviously, for us computer scientists, closed form does not necessarily mean computational efficient, because uh, it's like, so. The, the, the result is reducing a problem to another problem, and now you're left with understanding this other problem. So, uh, in principle, we'd like both closed form, that is, understanding something about the problem we're solving, and computationally efficient, being able to run the algorithm, the mechanism. Right, so that's all background. Uh, and let me first, uh, oh yeah, so, right, and a central level problem after Myerson is, is there a similar picture for multi-dimensional settings where the values on these edges are going a bit there are different, okay? And there's a large work by the work after Myerson and recently computer science we've been able to get constant factor approximations to this problem. All right, result by Chal et al and Otocharya. And probably some are missing here. Uh, so uh, here is our results with uh, Matt Weinberg. So we provided the closed form. We understand something about the problem. Efficiently computable, nearly optimal revenue mechanisms, when either the number of items is constant or the number of bidders is constant. And I'm going to show pictures of what I mean. Uh, but uh, let me just first say that in the first case, 
that is when uh, uh, the number of items is a constant. We allow every bidder to have an arbitrary correlated distribution over the items, uh, but we assume that the bidders come from the same population, so their valuations are IID. In the second case, we assume that every bidder has IID values for the items, but we can have different distributions for the bidders. Pictorially, the constant item results, yep. Uh, yes, yeah, since so, yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So pictorially, uh, because I'm running three items and M bidders, what I want is I allow an arbitrary correlate distribution here, but I assume that uh, uh, the distributions are the, uh, the same for every bidder. Okay, that's that's the setting I'm looking at. Which buyer wants just buy one item? Uh, I can do, yeah, as, as many as he wants. As 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 wants. I'm going to say the precise uh, results uh, with regards to the demands and stuff. Uh, and the constant number of bidders result is I have three bidders A and N items. Uh, I want these things to be IID from some distribution, but this distribution could be different from the, for the bidders. Uh, if I had to vote between these two, I would say that this is the more interesting scenario. Uh, so coming back to the result, let me give you, let me address some of the questions. So I can do arbitrary budget and demand constraints, and the mechanisms are uh, actually price bundles. Um, the solution concept is uh, exact Bayesian incentive compatibility or epsilon incentive compatibility. You, you choose what you want. Uh, we're going to get you the best among these guys if you choose this, and the best among these guys if you choose that. And nearly optimal means that when the, I don't know if you can read that, but when the value distributions are normalized to have support 0, 1, I'm going to get you a narrative epsilon error from, from the best revenue. Or if your distributions are more than hazard rate, I'm going to get you a multiplicative approximation. Okay, so these are the results we have for the setting. Um, and I suppose I want to give a glimpse of the techniques. Uh, so first of all, uh, and that goes back to understanding something about the problem uh, and not just saying that there is an optimum. So first of all, it's easy to see that you know, finding the optimal mechanism is just an LP, okay? So uh, except it's a giant LP. All right, what I mean, so suppose D is the distribution, the joint distribution of everybody's values for all items. So that's some distribution in this set, specifying all the VIJs. Uh, so here's what I want to do, right? So the mechanism, for every point in the support of this distribution, the mechanism wants to identify what is the, uh, what is the allocation of items to bidders the mechanism wants to do, as well as what the prices are going to be. Okay? So the mechanism has to decide on what is the, sort of like what, what he wants, to, the mechanism wants to do in every draw from this distribution. All right, so let's introduce variables for all these possible uh, things. So we can write an NLP that for every point in the support of the distribution looks for an allocation distribution and a price list, prices for the bidders. And of course, it's all the constraints we want, compatibility, rationality, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So, um, so you find it support for, yeah, so you find it support. I'm going to, that's right, otherwise it's an infinite LP. I'm going to tell you how to do it. Yeah. Uh, so now, this LP lives in so many dimensions, right? The support of the distribution and the possible allocations of items to bidders, so it's exponential in many respects, all right? But uh, this is not the smartest thing one can, one can do, so using the Birkhoff von Neumann theorem, one can write the same LP except only look for the marginals of the uh, allocation distribution to the bidders, so that reduces the size of the LP to, to, to live in support times polynomial dimensions. So really the bottleneck is the support of the distribution. And for the settings that I talked about, unfortunately the support is exponential. So we have to understand something about the problem to uh, go forward. All right, is everything clear, what I'm, what I'm doing here? So that's just uh, observations. Uh, so now the first ingredient in uh, the result is to try to understand the symmetries that exist in the setting. So we show the following result. 
So let D is a, the distribution. So that's a general result that holds for general settings, but we exploit it algorithmically in the settings that I talked about. So let D be the distribution of values. And let S be a set of permutations, uh, an arbitrary set of permutations, so that if I permute the value distribution by sigma, by a member in this set, then the distribution says uh, does not change. Okay, suppose you know, for a given distribution D, I look for all possible permutations of items and bidders, such that if I permute the output of the, permit of the distribution with that uh, permutation, nothing changes distributionally. All right, so let's this S with the... It's sort of like a product, so I permute items and I permute bidders, yeah. Um, <coughs> so the result is that if S is the set of permutations satisfied by the value distribution, then uh, there exists an optimal uh, randomized mechanism that respects all the sim symmetry simultaneously in this set. Um, so in particular, if I give to the mechanism a permutation of a value vector, all I observe in the output is the permutation of the output of the mechanism if I plugged in V. All right. And uh, my, my sort of intuition for, 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 for shooting for this theorem is Nash's symmetry theorem. So if you read Nash's paper, he proved a similar result that uh, in every game there is a Nash equilibrium that simultaneously respects all the symmetries that may exist in the game. Right. Don't need that. Uh, Don't need that. Take, uh, take a symmetry of the mechanism and average it. So you have problems. That's it. Right, so that was my intuition. So the randomization is real. Linearity of uh, yeah, linearity is what really buys it. Linear. So average the mechanism. Take the symmetry, apply to the mechanism, take the average, so the average mechanism is there. Mechanism is a satisfied set of compatibility addresses. So, you know, the proof is similar to that, yeah. Yes, No, no, no. No, that's, the, that's true for any, for any distribution. That's a general result for anything. Uh, so the not so the above symmetry that doesn't hold for deterministic mechanisms, and it certifies the existence of a succinct solution to the problem, except uh, it's not trivial how to find that solution. So we have a huge LP, that result certifies uh, the existence of a succinct solution. Uh, the next thing we have to do is to try to uh, use this result to get the succinct solution. So that's... Uh, to do that, we, we, we sort of show some monotonicity. So it's really a puzzle of things. So, uh, and monotonicity holds if you have an item symmetric mechanism. Okay, so if you have a truthful item symmetric mechanism, then it has to satisfy some, so, some kind of monotonicity. And putting together these two things, we can get a succinct LP if there is enough symmetry in the distribution of values. And the settings that I talked about are examples for when the resulting LP is polynomial size. So now, uh, coming back to Sergio's question, so continues to discrete. So uh, this all works if your value distribution has discrete is discrete. Uh, what happens if it's continuous? Well, uh, you discretize, okay, obviously, to get a finite support. Uh, so now, if you do the previous approach, you get a, an epsilon Bayesian sense compatibility. But now, what you do is you use the discretized distribution to get the mechanism. And you use that as a back end to your mechanism. And then as a front end, you, you, you do a VCG auction where the sort of like continuous bidders buy discretized representatives in a VCG framework. And that results in a, a sort of like exact big rather than epsilon big. Uh, so you transfer the approximation from the truthfulness to the revenue. And that is similar to the uh, a recent technique developed by Hardline Kleinberg and Malek Yan. Uh, except there are some differences here that we have to address, that, but I'm not going to get into that. So the last component is uh, sort of like probabilistic, uh, and that goes in the way of developing extreme value theorems. Um, so here's what I mean. So, so, so far we can get a narrative approximation when the distributions are, are normalized. So um, one would like to now go from uh, this approximation to a multiplicative one. How are we going to do that? But here's an interesting result that we show. 
So let x1 for Excel be independent, but not necessarily identically distributed uh, monohazard rate random variables. So the uh, situation could be like this. So this could be got Gaussian distributions or exponential or a uniform or whatever you want. And these are spread out the whole space. So you could have different supports and so on and so forth. Um, so what we show is that there exists an anchoring point beta somewhere in, 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 in the real line. So that if I look at the maximum of these guys, then with constant probability, it's going to fall to the right of this anchoring point. Uh, OK. That's OK. So, but the important point is that uh, if you shoot off uh, some distance off of this guy, but that doesn't depend on n or whatever, uh, only on epsilon, then the contribution to the expectation of the maximum from samples of the maximum that fall here is tiny. It's epsilon times beta. Okay, so the, the result is that no matter how your distributions are uh, placed in the real line, you can find a anchoring point so that the maximum of these guys falls to the right of that with constant probability. And at the same time, if you shoot off a uh, distance 1 over epsilon times beta, uh, basically nothing here is relevant for the expectation of the maximum. So in other words, what that means is that most of the revenue comes from an uh, interval uh, of this form. So an anchoring point times epsilon and an anchoring point times 1 over epsilon. There's no dependence on them. So it's concentrated in a constant uh, domain for monohazard rate distributions. So we also show a similar result for regular, but uh, it's more complicated, so I'm not going to show it here. Um, So the reason this holds is that if I price at a constant price, beta, then with constant probability, I'm going to hit it. So the revenue is going to be at least a constant fraction of beta. So this is, and, and then having that allows us to truncate everything that happens outside of that interval. All right, so this, this, is, this, this four pieces uh, together give you the uh, uh, mechanisms that I talked about earlier. Um, and uh, the question is, what happens if you want to go beyond symmetries? So, yeah. yeah. So just understand. Yeah. So what you what you have, you are solving an LP problem, which is simplified because of all the symmetries. But you have no clue how the solution looks like. You just yeah. solve it. Yeah. You uh, just solve the a big LP from the data, uh, whatever comes out. So we have a right. right. So, so the structural results we know is where the revenue comes from. We know it comes from this small interval. Right. We know that the solution is going to be symmetric. Yeah. So you and then uh, make it right. more uh, compact. This is what we have in terms of understanding the structural solution. Yeah. Yeah. So now the question is what, did, what happens if you want to go beyond symmetries? Uh, so say you have a single bidder and has independent values for the items. Uh, and, you know, there is the, the, the result I presented earlier allows you to solve this problem if these guys are, I, I, are the same distributions. Uh, now, if there are different distributions, then all bets are off. So uh, there's no symmetry in the settings. I don't know how to solve it. Maybe Sergio can do it uh, on the fly. But, uh, it's a difficult problem. So, uh, so the next question I ask is, can I at least solve the pricing problem? Can I find prices for these paintings so that I get the best revenue? So at least for that problem, I can write down the objective function. Okay? So I want to figure out prices for the items. So that I optimize my expecta expected price, the expected price that this guy is going to pay. So that is the sum of all items, the price of the item, and the probability that this item uh, g gives him more happiness than any other item, and say it's also positive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, previous switch topics. In fact, can I ask you a question about the previous? Topic? Oh yeah. Um, so if you had to say like one sentence about the closed form solution, what would that? Yeah, so I, I, that was my answer, I think, to Sergio. So the, what we understand about the structure of the solution is that it has some symmetries. If the value distributions is symmet are symmetric, that, uh, and that the revenue comes if the model has the rate distributions from an uh, uh, interval of the form epsilon times something, 1 over epsilon times something. Uh, and, I mean, really, this is the same topic, except that I'm going to should for deterministic mechanisms, since uh, I have no clue how to do randomized mechanisms. The, the big change is you change the number of items. 
No, the previous setting was either the uh, number of bidders is constant or the number of items is constant. So when the number of items is constant, I allow arbitrary correlated distributions, but I want it to, the bidders come from the same population. Uh, in the scenario where I have a constant number of bidders, I could do, in the case, these are independent, uh, IID, but, but now I'm sort of like watering down to a single bidder than the constant number of bidders to see if I can do independent, but not identical. So in any event, so I, I cannot, in this problem, I can at least write down the objective function. It, it looks ugly. So uh, what, what can you do about this problem? Why is this the objective function? So it's the sum of the real paintings, the price of the painting, times the probability that is this painting makes me happier than any other painting. It, yeah, yeah, you have to add zero. It's positive and bigger than anything else. Yeah, I have to write the bigger equal than zero. Uh, so this is my objective function. Um, ah, and this problem has been uh, for for this problem, uh, Charla Hartline Kleinberg provided a constant factor approximation. So my, our results for this problem with Yang Kai is that uh, nearly optimal efficient pricing algorithms for a single unit demand bidder whose values are independent. Okay. So <clears throat> this is weaker in two respects. One is it's a deterministic rather than a randomized mechanism. Second, we, have, we need the guy to be unit demand or constant demand. Okay? But it's stronger because it allows independent values for the items, but not identical. Um, so it's the same, the same stuff. Um, and uh, just a glimpse of the techniques. So the symmetry lemma breaks down, so I cannot use it for deterministic mechanisms. So I cannot, and on the other hand, there's not enough symmetry to apply the previous results. So in b basically, our techniques here are orthogonal to what they were for the previous problem. And they're more, they have a more, more of a probabilistic flavor. Uh, so, and that, that sort of requires a, a conceptual uh, sort of like a switch, so, which is that in principle, the search space for this problem is the price vectors. And, and what one would like to do is to like beat that, this down to death, discretizing the discretize until there is like a small set of possible solutions. Uh, it turns out that this is not the right approach for this problem. So the way we look at it is we focus instead on, on the output of the, like, so we focus on revenue distributions that are induced by price vectors. And notice that this space is inherently exponential because there's n items with a uh, constant number of prices say each, while here, this is a scalar, but it's a distribution. So the question is, with this cons conceptual switch of focus fr from input to output of the mechanism, can we uh, solve the problem? So what we do here is we do, we, we do some probabilistic, uh, so, so, some probabilistic arguments. So we first of all identify the right notion of distance in this space of all possible revenue distributions. And then we uh, provide an implicit cover of the space with a polynomial size of representatives. So in other words, the, what this says is that the input space is huge. On the other hand, the induced uh, revenue distributions are not so many. Okay? So there's an exponential number of inputs, but the possible outputs are polynomially many. So we can look at the set of possible outputs, revenue distributions, find the right one, the best one, and then go backwards and figure out what price vector is consistent with that distribution. So this is our switch of focus from input to output in this problem. Uh, and I mean, if you want uh, some more structural results in this scenario for model yeah. house of yeah. do, you, do you have any, do you know anything about how far the price is from optimal? Yes. You are, you are comparing it's optimal, one minus epsilon. Oh, it's, it's a constant, constant factor. factor. Yes. This yeah. is not our result. It's a, it's a recent result by Charles Lerard. Yeah. Okay. But it's a constant factor away. Uh, some structural results. Yeah. For monotonous hazard rate distribution. So uh, we put two results in the flavors of a constant number of price suffices and a single price suffices if you're IID. So 
that, that sort of like should resonate with previous results in this area where a, a single price could give you a constant factor. So what this says, what the first result says is that for any epsilon you want, if you're shooting for a, uh, an epsilon approximate solution, one minus epsilon times opt, then you only need to use a function of epsilon different price levels for your item. Right? So you have n items, but only function of epsilon distinct prices suffice to give you the best 1 minus epsilon times the optimal value. Right? Where this function g does not depend on the uh, distribution, so does not depend on n, does not depend on anything uh, in the input of the problem. Okay? So for any pricing scenario, g of 1 over epsilon price suffice to give you the best revenue. Sorry? No, it's not as simple as that. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, it's not that. The epsilon grid, uh, these distributions are supported on the, con on, uh, the, the infinite line. So. so you cannot just, uh, you have to do something smarter than that. Um, and a single price suffices for IID. The result has a similar flavor. So for any epsilon, if you're shooting for 1 minus epsilon times opt, then a single price will suffice as long as the number of items is bigger than some function of epsilon. That does not depend on the input, on, on the instance. Okay, so these are the two, two structural results if you want in this area. Uh, so this is the summary of the results. So this is for the auction problem with budgets and uh, demands, general demands. Okay, so constant number of items, three items, many bidders, and they can be arbitrarily correlated here or constant number of bidders and many items where these guys have to be ID, but uh, players could be different. And then a single unit demand bidder and only pricing if they're uh, independent. All right, so open problems were, yeah. That's the last result. This is a, su slide. This is a summary, yeah. Slide. Previous slide. Oh, this is all. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, single price suffices for ID. Ah, it's when n is large, very large. As long as you have something, some function of epsilon yes. items. But if n is large, then you know the maximum more or less, and you shoot for it or something. You you have to figure yeah, out okay. what you want to do. Okay, okay, wrong. And you have to show that it concentrates yeah, no, no, there no, no, and so, no, so forth. Yeah. But that ties in some sense well with the previous okay. results. Yeah. So these are this is the overview of the results and. Uh, uh, just to just you know to 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 uh, finish. Uh, so, what is the complexity of the exact problem? So, I presented approximation algorithms arbitrary to, for arbitrarily close approximation, but I, I don't know the complexity of the exact problem, uh, and I, th I think we need to find it. <laughs> so, uh, I conjectured it's sharply hard to find the best randomized mechanism, even if you have a single bidder, and. Uh, it is already known that if the if the bidder has correlated values for the items, the problem is hard. It's intractable. Uh, and then, you know, I would like to, to, to do the auction setting. I would like to solve it for beyond symmetric settings that I consider here. And uh, one has to combine whatever insights from the LP approach with the probabilistic theorems developed for the uh, pricing problem. And that's it. Thanks. Questions? So the view is all about the monitor habit rate mapping this data. That implies that uh, optimal Myerson pricing will extract a constant fraction of surplus. The you're talking about the extreme value theorem. Yes. The that anchoring point is going to give you a constant factor of the optimal revenue. Uh, I don't think that the, this anchoring point is the Myerson price. No, Uh, it, it better be, yes. Yeah. It better be there. Yeah. So if you look at one item, then you get the full, you get a constant fraction of the surplus. Let's say in the full setting, you don't need to say the log m factor or the log m factor. So are you, are you looking to switch the setting between... Uh, I'm looking to use uh, it in a completely different context, just the characterization result. Oh, the characterization in a single dimensional setting? <coughs> Revenue and the optimal welfare are one of the constant. 
Okay, so that's already so that's okay, so that's already known. So that but that would be another way to no. but to get a <coughs> to get a lump of epsilon and <coughs> this would be a constant. In fact it's it's one over E. One yeah. over E constant. So there is Okay, um, so our next talk is